Welcome to the realm of magic and mystery, classic horror and sci-fi. You are now entering the House of the Unusual podcast with your hosts, Eddie and Joe. Welcome everyone, I am your host, Joe Pavlansky, pop culture historian, writer for Scary Monsters magazine, and curator of the Crypt of Classics. Co-hosting, as always, is the maestro of mail-order mysteries and owner of HouseOfTheUnusual.com, the one, the only, Eddie Guevara. Today, we have two special guests checking in at the, in at the House of the Unusual. We have Todd, the man with the impeccable character Machen, also known as King of the Sea Monkeys, and guest Dan Goodsell, creator of Mr. Toast. So before we get in it, how's everybody doing tonight? Excellent. Really excellent. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Now, Dan, this is your first time on here because uh, everybody knows enough about Todd. So we'll get into we'll we'll get into him later. <laughs> later. But Dan, why don't you give everybody a, a little rundown of who you are? Um, you know, what you have out there, you know, any websites you have or, or social media, you know, outlets you have that people could come check out your products and all that. Um, yeah, I'm Dan Goodsell. I'm an artist. I live in Los Angeles, California. I'm also a collector and have been involved in a lot of collecting type things, especially on the internet. I run a website called theimaginaryworld.com where I showcase a bunch of my collections, including kids' food packaging, cereal boxes, and theme park stuff, and storybook park stuff, and I've been, in addition to being an artist, I've been a dealer for the past 20-plus years, and so I make my living uh, buying and selling collectibles, especially on eBay. So that's where I think I ran into Eddie. And uh, yeah, as an artist, I do a cartoon called Mr. Toast, which I've been doing for about 20 years also, which includes comics and toys and all sorts of internet processes. And you can uh, check me out on uh, YouTube. I have a channel. You can just search for Dan Goodsell. And I've been doing a little show on there where I go through, I went through all of my collections, not all my collections, but a lot of my collections and made videos of all of them. So there's like 20, 20 plus one hour videos that you can see all the crazy things I collect. Awesome. Awesome. And uh, Todd, I know you, you've been pretty busy the last few weeks. So what's, what's been new with you in, in, in uh, Todd's world? In the sea monkey world. Uh, yeah, there is a lot going on. I tell you, um, I just did a, a, a big shipment to Yolanda Signorelli. She was the um, widow of Harold von Braun, has, took over the uh, sea monkey um, it brand. And um, so, yeah, there's a lot of stuff going on there. She'll be receiving it this week. We should start seeing some new products coming out here very soon. There's one I'm very excited about. Um, she'll have all the components to start putting that together and get posted. And then a prototype for another product that we're working on. She, she got that. So um, things are moving along there. Um, I did want to say, though, that um, I knew Dan. It's, it, probably, it was probably 20 years ago, Dan, because I think you were just starting Mr. Toast back when we were kind of hobnobbing. It, I, I started Mr. Toast seriously in 2003. So okay. Probably- yeah. 17 years ago. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh huh. So he's wrong again with that. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's about right. And, um, and, uh, I don't know. Do you, Dan, do you remember how we met? I think we just met, uh, through the internet. And uh, you, you were mainly doing Oz stuff. And it might have been when I was starting to work on my website. And maybe we conversed about Oz premiums, maybe? I yeah. I know well, I was I, doing research I, on that. Yeah, I know. Um, I got some. I got a couple of really good things from you. Um, one, one of them, and they kind of go in my uh, little Sea Monkey side collection. So one of them was Moon Rocks. Okay. Uh, which was like a Magic Rocks kit, but it was from uh, like, like an outer space model where the Rocks grew in this um, kind of plastic spaceship. And the other thing that you got for me, which I really treasure, is um, it's an old chameleon kit by Circus Pet Company. 
Um, and it's just like this, it's, it's a little like mail order box with a little like cellophane front. Um, and you, you see those ad in comic books and they sold them a lot in Johnson Smith and things like that. And then a little box of the, um, mealworm food, but, um, yeah, that, that's, that's something that I absolutely love. I love all of that old vintage kind of pet toy mail order kind of stuff. So that's really been my world the last 20, 20 years, I guess. <laughs> yeah. 20, 20 years. Well, <laughs> yeah, well absolutely. if, if his, uh, Mr. Toast would have been 20 years old, he would have called it Mr. Todd. Okay? <laughs> but, but it's not 20. You see, Todd, <laughs> you know, I met Mr. Dan Goodsell here. This gentleman was a, a gentleman and a scholar back in 2012, I think it was. When I was with uh, Kirk DeMaris, we were signing the book uh, Mail Order Mysteries over in uh, the Comic-Con in New York, and he had traveled from oh. California. So uh, Kirk introduced me to him, and this man was kind enough to loan me his original Moon Monster poster, one that I did not have at the time. And later, yes, I got two originals after that, but I was able to use that poster that Dan kindly enough sent me to you know to reproduce and sell to the crowd and and, and it was awesome um, that's how i met dan yes servicing collectors 27 that's uh that's what i do awesome uh, not todd correct you didn't okay just want to make sure of that then now now todd have we got to we got to bring something up on this podcast and and i'm sure you you know what it is that we have a bone to pick with somebody here <laughs> and i'm not going to I'm not going to say who it is, but his initials are Eddie Guevara. And he sent us – you go ahead and describe your pet. Now, now, Dan, this is the type of person that we're, we're really dealing with here with Eddie. Todd, go ahead and, and tell, tell Dan and everybody what, what you received in the mail, what type of package you received from – from Eddie, uh, our, our friend, Eddie Guevara. Our good friend, Eddie Guevara from the House of the Unusable. So, so yeah, so I get a tracking number, and so I'm supposed to be getting this package in the mail, and Joe gets one, too. And so, you know, it's like, uh, you know how we are. So we're like, I'm tracking it, tracking it, tracking it, watching it kind of inch its way closer to my house. You know, like little kids waiting for, you know, this is going to be a great <laughs> gift, a great package that's coming, you know, can't wait for it. <laughs> So Joe and I get our boxes and um, <laughs> and we open them up <laughs> and it's full of invisible presents. <laughs> to say the least. I told him I got a box full of trash. There was bubble wrap and, and crumpled up newspapers and that's it. <laughs> I said, what kind of crummy <laughs> gift is this? <laughs> he sent us empty boxes. And I got to tell you, man, I laughed so damn hard. Uh <laughs> well, so, Dan, if you get a package from Eddie and it feels lighter than air, you, you know what to expect. <laughs> yes, I was suspicious. I opened mine from the back just because <laughs> I, I learned not to trust this man. So, so I have the label intact, and I trust me, I've kept I've kept this box. Well, you know, I, here's me. I you know I, I I'm thinking I'm like okay, it's real light, so I'm thinking maybe it's it's something paper in it. You know, maybe you know he sent me a, a nice paper item. So I was I, I got my knife out. I was cutting the the front real gingerly <laughs> to make sure that you know I didn't rip into it or or anything like that. And then I said, oh, bubble wrap. I said that's that's odd. So I'm. I'm I said, I, I don't want to just rip through it. Maybe, you know, there's something small or paper in there and I'm going through it and I reached the bottom. I'm like, this son of a gun sent me an empty box filled with trash, basically. You know, Dan, <laughs> let me, let me tell you something. Dan. <laughs> Dan, this happened because my man over there happens to have bought a, I made a, a version of the Johnson Smith Ghost. A box version, and I had Craig Tobik, the originator of the Ghost, one of the originators actually. Uh, the originator was the owner of Johnson Smith, but you know Craig Tobik actually helped him package it and and put the ad out. And uh, one of the things that happened was that um, Mr. Todd there decided to buy one, and not only did he just place the order and sent it out, he was asking me the next day where was it. <laughs> 
<laughs> so the, the order actually took him an additional because uh, for some reason media mail to him went a little slower than usual. <laughs> And when he finally gets it, he sends me. Go, go ahead, Todd. You read the letter you sent. Oh, God, I don't. Oh, I don't have it in front of me. Hold on. <laughs> you don't. Have, well, you memorize it. You can say what you put. Hold on. Let me pull. Yeah. So um, let's see here. Um, oh, let's see if I can find this real quick. I thought. I thought you. I thought Eddie would have it. You know. Uh, yeah. Right. Uh huh. Yeah. So um, hold on, guys. Jeez. Um, oh. Well, that should take me longer. <laughs> I wasn't prepared for this. Let's see. Never prepared for uh, home. Believe this guy? But yeah, so, um, well, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think, Dan? What do you think of the man Todd did? What, do you, what can you say to tell us about uh, what, what can I tell? Uh, I've found him to be highly professional, but I guess... <laughs> No, he, he's an impeccable man. Relationship you know, seems to be uh, predicated on pranks, and uh, <laughs> so um, I know that I'm not going to be able to oh, you. during the month of April. So, <laughs> yeah. Okay. yeah, for, for April first, we are the whole month. We are not talking to Todd or Eddie. Dan, we'll have our own uh, for our, our own podcast aside from those guys at that time. Cause... Dan and Joe. Gosh, you know. <laughs> yeah, hold on. This 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 website is not working. <laughs> see, see what you know. You know these, these these darn movie stars. You know they think they can just take up all our time now and just do what they want. Yeah. Yeah. It's not good. The more you become famous, they figure yeah, out. Yeah. 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 Okay. Hold on. Well. So. Uh, yeah. Anyway, Eddie sucks. <laughs> Yeah, that was it. just uh, two words. Eddie sucks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now, while while he's while while Todd's you know searching through all his his movie there star you, files and all that, um, Dan, I have a question for you. Where did you come up with the concept and the idea for Mister Toast? Because it, I, I'd never heard of it until you know Eddie had turned me on to it, and I'm I was looking at a few of the cartoons and, and the drawings on. It. I said, "Man, this is pretty awesome." I said, "But you know, where did you get the the whole concept for?" For Mr. Toast. Um, well, what I say at conventions is I say he came from my love of breakfast. But, nice. but the true story <laughs> is that when I was in college, what I used to do is I used to go through the newspaper every day and I'd cut out photos of things that interested me. And I sort of, you know, I'd, I'd glue them into books and, you know, I just sort of use them as inspiration. And at one point, I saw a photo of a guy who was standing in front of one of those day old bread stores, you know, where they sell used bread and he dressed yeah. as a piece of bread. And so I started <laughs> doing drawing in my book, in my book and I, I drew a character and I called him Mr. Toad. My love of all sort of advertising characters like Mr. Bubble and whatnot. Yeah. But of course there never was a Mr. Toast character. Toast is not an actual product sort of a you know reconstituted bread you know it's bread being toasted so no, nobody sells toast except melba toast which is a different thing uh, you know you know dan i thought it was when you met todd at first you said two simple words I'm toast. Absolutely. And, uh, the character emerged yeah dan i gotta tell you I mean, I, I love Mr. Toast, and you had sent me some Mr. Toast stuff, and I still have it. So some of the little plush characters, I have the um, Pink Popsicle and the Mr. Toast and a couple others and some of your books and things like that. But the thing that I, the thing of the Mr. Toast thing that I love absolutely the most is Mr. Toast strolling. I have had more fun with that little video. Oh, and the video. Yeah, the video, yes. Um, and so I I use it at work. I used to play it in the office and because it's just it's just nonstop him strolling along whistling. And I would play it really <laughs> soft <laughs> until somebody on the floor screamed, Who's whistling? Oh. And the other thing I do is 
I sent it out to all of the managers as a stress reliever. I said, anytime I'm really feeling stressed at work, I said, I just turn on Mr. Toast strolling and it calms my nerves. So I've gotten more use out of Mr. Toast strolling. I absolutely love that thing. Yeah. Did, did you tell them what you did now? Now you replaced it with our, our podcast. Yeah, now I do listen to the podcast and... at work. Yeah. Except it's not calming at all. It's not calming. <laughs> yeah. It, it's more it's more stressful than than anything. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So i I found my uh, I found my review of my first um, my first order from House of the Unusable. Okay. So. Well, first is House of the Unusual. Yes, I did. You yes. It so uh, here we go. So I ordered your seven foot life size ghost that I would be able to control myself. I was expecting to receive an actual ghostly spirit of a tall deceased man that I could command to scare the crap out of my family, friends, and co-workers. Instead, I got a sheet of paper, a string, a balloon, and a piece of crappy plastic. <laughs> <laughs> what a ripoff. What kind of scam are you running there at House of the Unusual? You should change your name to House of the Unusable. This is junk. And on top of that, it took forever for it to arrive. So to summarize my purchase experience, perfect. I absolutely loved it. Just like I remember my mail order experiences as a kid. Thank you for allowing me to revisit my childhood all these decades later. Your seven foot ghost has a great new happy home with me. Thanks for the memories, Eddie, you demand. Now, see, Dan, think about this. How would I let this man receive a ghost and never have the experience of no mail? I have to make sure he get it the slow way. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, it's funny because I was just talking to somebody this weekend, and it's like all of those ads used to say things like four to six weeks for delivery, but it was really more like eight to 12. I mean, that was torture as a child waiting for that stuff to come. Yeah, half the time you you would forget about it. You know, six weeks later, a package would come. You're like, what the heck is this? You know, and you're like, oh, that's the item I ordered, you know, two, two three months ago. And sometimes it never came. <laughs> a lot of kids are still and sometimes, waiting for their order. Sometimes it came and there was nothing in the box. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, just like the one I made sure you guys got for saying House of the Unusable. I fear I send you something that was unusable to me. That is. So. Oh. I, I I couldn't even use the box. I said it's, it's like he sent me his trash from home. <laughs> send me a box with his trash. <laughs> so what, what's your what's your take on this, Dan? Go ahead. Let's hear you out. Man. I my take on sending boxes of. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, your take on the whole mail order stuff. Don't tell us your history with mail order. His, his take is don't send boxes yeah, of garbage to people. You. Yeah, no. So, man, what are you, like? I know what kind of your past interests were, but what are you like? What's currently floating your boat? Uh, what, I I'm not collecting seriously right now, just because. You know, I have too much stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I can imagine. Um, so I've been I've been spending the past, you know, and what what I did when the whole COVID thing hit is I was like, okay, I'm gonna I have keep all my stuff, and I was like, I'm gonna get this very organized, and I'm gonna start selling some stuff, and so I have a little studio space in here, so I put a couch in here because usually it was just boxes filled, you know, to the roof. And so I, I put a couch in here and then I started doing my YouTube channel stuff. And I think, I think COVID has been a, been really good for me at least because it sort of helped me reinvest in my priorities of what I want to do with, right. with, with my life. And, you know, just sort of look at, you know, I mean, I love collecting and I will always have collectibles, but you know, do I need to have as many collectibles as I do? Probably yeah. not. Yeah. Well, I think in, in in one episode where we were talking about collectibles, Dad, Dan, you know, we all were discussing what we collected, and it turns out, you know, Eddie likes to collect eight, ten, twelve of of you know a single thing, you know, buying out out stores like what was it, the Robbie the Robot? You bought eight of them or something like that. At the store. <laughs> you had to bring that up, didn't you? <laughs> yeah, you because know, I'm I'm like you, Dan. When when all this COVID hit, I I kind of you know I have a basement full of collectibles, and then. I live in a Cape Cod, so I have my attic is full of my comics and magazines. So during 
the whole COVID thing, I kind of, you know, really cut down on, you know, on, on some of the stuff that I had, you know, what, what do I actually really, really want to keep and what could I, I part ways with, I said, yeah, I'm going to, you know, sell some stuff, you know, build up some extra cash to, you know, set aside. And I think that lasted a whole, you know, few days. And then I'm like, Oh, I got this extra cash. I could go buy some more comic yeah. books and magazines. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's like I got rid of stuff, but then I got more stuff. <laughs> I mean, and that's, you know, collecting is, is in a nature of certain people and, you know, it's, it's in my nature just to, to walk but I think there's also a necessity to sort of look at your collectibles and understand them and try and try and further whatever cre- other creative pursuits you have. And I, I've been spending a lot of time doing that. Yeah. Now, now do you collect any, any type of like, uh, like any horror stuff or, or like classic horror memorabilia? Um, mostly what I've been trying to limit myself and what I like the most are printed materials. So, and, you know, okay. I mean, like I said, I collect cereal boxes, kids' food packaging, funny face drink mixes. Um, and so there there are some definite monster things in there. There's a thing called Little Monster Cookies, which are these incredible 1965 cookie boxes. So if I have both of those, which are something that oh, you nice. could probably talk to 100 monster collectors and none of them have ever even seen one. Right. Because those two boxes are the only two I've ever seen in any collection ever. So, uh, you know, I have a few monster yeah. things that are interesting, but, you know, there's there's a lot of competition <laughs> in monster stuff. And there has been, it's, oh, you know, I, I started I started dealing in collectibles in like 80, 89, I started dealing. And it's like, I've, I've had a few really nice things, but, you know, I found the original, uh, box it was like a cardboard box to the original don post frankenstein mask which oh wow i, I have yet to have another one of those yeah, you know, yeah. and I, I sold it years ago yeah, but it was one. this beautiful cardboard box with frankenstein on it. it was missing the tops and bottoms i bought it at a flea market for you know like a dollar or two dollars because they didn't know what it nice. you know they had no i think it was is it don is that the mask? all right wasn't I the guy that uh, sold you that down? So. Unless, unless you set up in Pasadena sometimes. <laughs> hey, you never know. <laughs> now, I, I recently started collecting about a, a month or so ago, and I you know, I never realized how hard some of them are to find, but the, the old uh, Bazooka Joe comics that you would get from the uh, – that had the gun yeah, in one? them. Joe. Oh, so, Bazooka no, sure. Joe. Yeah, I, I was going through eBay and I, I found a nice little set. I think it was from, oh, if I remember off the top of my head, seventy four, yeah. I believe. And I got the got the set from a, a guy who he specifically deals with, you know, Bazooka Joe stuff on eBay, and he sent me a few uh, extras with it. And um, I corresponded with him uh, for a little bit. I even bought the uh, a few years back. They came out with a, yeah. a Bazooka Joe book. And uh, the guy that actually sold me the Bazooka Joe stuff on eBay, he a lot of his collection was in that book. And so I, I was really searching through eBay and Etsy and all that for Bazooka Joe comics. And I, I couldn't believe how hard they are to find, you know, especially, you know, pre-1980 I comics. Just, I just sold on eBay <laughs> last week or two weeks ago the very first Bazooka Joe comic. Yeah, they did, did, a, you really? they did a series of character comics where it was full size that had right. Luca Joe on it, and they did, you know, the whatever the it's like five or six main characters. And I sold the Bazooka Joe one a couple weeks ago, and then like maybe three or four months ago, I'd sold another one. So, you know, that's that is the kind of thing that I've been looking for, you know, for the past thirty years. Well, sure. Let me ask you a question, Dan and Joe. Uh, the question I have is simple. I have a Bazooka Joe original sure. letter from the company sending, I forget what it is, it's still in its original envelope. And I have about 172 Bazooka, Bazooka Joe comics. Uh, I also have one of my favorite things that I always wanted as a kid and I finally got was the magnet set, the one that looked like two little wheels, like a barbell, a small sure, barbell. One of the, Do you remember one of that, the Dan? You'd, premiums you'd send away for, sure. Yeah, I got that premium. I do have a large uh, Bazooka Joe collection. Oh, really? I'm, 
Have you looked at my stuff, Joe? I mean, ha- I mean have Dan. I? Have I looked at? I've, have you? Have you gone to House of the Unusual website? Have you looked around? I've gone. The, the I mean, I've I've gone through the... portions of it, and I've watched a number of the videos. I don't think you know. I mean, there's there's a lot of nooks and crannies, and it's yeah. an no, no. interesting place to navigate. <laughs> Yeah, you didn't you didn't see the Bazooka Joe comics in the in the box that was crammed behind other boxes. <laughs> well, if you what more than YouTube, uh, I have an actual tour on the the it's loaded up to the House of the Unusual dot com. It's about eight nine minutes long, and it tours the area where I have my office, and that itself is not counting the ten by twelve foot storage I have and the six by five foot closet in my house <laughs> that's packed to the corner. Yeah. I started in 85 collecting and it kind of put me over the board. I was hoping you guys can buy all my stuff and this way I can retire rich. And- yeah. No, I've got my own problems. <laughs> oh, yeah. Hey, well, what do you mean? So you're a famous movie star now. The problem. Exactly. That's what I'm saying. I'm like, oh, no, geez. trust me. Let me hear Each one problems. of us have our own problems with our own amount of stuff. I guarantee you, we all battle with that. Uh, that collecting mentality oh, yeah. and uh, and then the like, oh my God, I got so much stuff. It's like becoming a burden on me and, and yet the, you're compelled to continue to look for things and as you're looking for things, you find new things and um, but but I'm curious because it seems like that everybody, at least on this call, we are all like reclaiming our youth in our collectibles. Yeah, and, and you you're pushing us off because now that they advanced you uh, something with six zeros behind for the movie, now all of a sudden you're brushing us off. Wow. What an impeccable... No, but isn't that true? Don't you think that's why most people collect is because they're reclaiming their youth or they're like finally have some um, exposable income so they can go back and buy the things that they wanted and their parents wouldn't let them have? You know what, Todd, I always think about that when when I'm collecting. I, I do think of that a lot because I... You know, I when I was younger, I grew up in the 80s, so I was always a collector of... You know, I always had the 80s toys, G.I. Joe, He-Man, you know, Ninja Turtles. <clears throat> so I still, to this day, I still try to, every time I go to, you know, two of my buddies own a, own a uh, local uh, secondhand toy store. And I mean, every time I go in there, I always look for, you know, the toys that I had as a, as a child that I might have sold or broken or lost over the years, whether it be G.I. Joe, He-Man, uh, Ninja Turtles, any type of horror figures or whatnot. So I'm always in there you know, hunting for stuff like that. And that's kind of how the uh, Bazooka Joe thing came up. I, I was, I, I, I was sitting around and, and I was, you know, kind of reminiscing in my mind, you know, about, you know, when I was young and all that going up to the, I had a, a store about a block from me that I would go up there and I would buy a yoo a little Debbie Brownie and some Bazooka Joe gum. And I remember the comics and that's kind of what got me back into, you know, hunting for these comics on eBay and, you know, starting to get back into them, you know, like right. I need something exactly. else to collect. I yeah. think if you look at collecting, which I, I, I do way too much, um, you know, you sort of, you have your childhood, you know, I was born in 65 and then, you know, I was buying comics continuously. I stopped buying comics sort of in 76, but then I started up again, like in 78. And then in 83, I started looking for the toys of my childhood so, you know, basically, what is that? 65, 75, 85. So, so I started looking for that stuff when I was in, you know, maybe a little later than that, maybe 86. Mm-hmm. So it's like, when, that, when I was that's talking. interesting that you said that, Dan. Dan, I was born yeah, August of I, 1964. Yeah. And um, I started, I don't know, in 68, I got here from Cuba. Then in the 70s, I started with my first item was the seven foot ghost. And then I started, you know, it's kind of funny because I, I just realized now that you said that we're not only the same age, but we basically grew up in the same type of mentality, I think, you know. Um, yeah, in the 80s is when I started recouping everything, 
you know that when you say comic books, I bought in the 70s, you found comic books in every store. A uh, few people don't remember this. Maybe you can, Dan. There was a time, I think between, I would say 1981 through about 85 or something. That well, that you didn't was find comic the direct books market started changing things. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's what happened, right? Yeah, because I remember then in, in 84 with the advent of the WWF becoming so popular and magazines shooting all over from WWF, uh, the old mail order companies from the from the 40s and 50s started, I mean, from the 70s started coming back on. Now, I don't know if you're aware, Dan, uh, I, when I was back in 1985, when I got married and I wanted to start my own mail order business, I first started selling books by mail. I, I did, you know, Melvin Powers. Uh, I did uh, jo- Joseph Cosman, the guy who invented the, uh, you know, uh, his uncle invented the Uncle Milton. From, but Joseph Cosman wrote the book, How I Made $2 Million in Mail Order, whatever. And I started selling books and, and, I, and I did with them and the Millinger Group as well. But then after that, when I started, I started looking for the original mail order companies. And in 1987, um, 88, I tracked down the original Honor House, of course, and I met with Edwin Wagman five different times. I tracked down the original Fun Factory and convinced the original owner, uh, Lou Weiss, uh, to start up with me. And I ran an ad in 1993 of a full page ad in, in DC Comics, which Todd just actually was able to purchase one of the comics recently, making my company Fun Factory before, of course, I changed it over to House of the Unusual the last company that ever ran a novelty mail order company in comic books in 1949 or 48, uh, 1938, I'm sorry, when the first Superman came out, Action Comics, Johnson Smith was the first company that ever ran that. And then in the 80s, I befriended Craig Taubeck, which was the acting kind of CEO for the Johnson Smith company from 1968 to about 2010. And for almost 40 years being there, and I befriended him, and I drove 359 miles to actually have lunch with him when I went to Florida. And we became really good friends, and he's been helping me with a lot of my mail order things. And, and Lou Weiss, in fact, recently, one of the upcoming shows, I'm going to have both Lou Weiss, the original owner of Fun Factory from the 70s, and Craig Taubeck on the show at the same time. Um I, you know, they, they'll break back and they'll remember me as an 18 year old kid bothering them, you know, but, um, Lou Weiss made my dream come true, which was run a full page ad in DC comics. And, you know, I got to meet Bernie Slotnick, which was the guy who was in, in charge of the advertising department for DC comics for like 30, 40 years. Uh, his, his niece was the Archie comics. So my history in mail order really took off in, in 1985. And, and and that's you know then I had a magic shop for two years and you know it's been it's been an interesting path and I think me and you have well I have always time. though I mean like I can go back to the beginning of my life and I have always been um, fa- fascinated or obsessed Talk with mission. something and I've always collected <laughs> in whatever little capacity even as a child I could I could collect and, you know, maybe it was dinosaurs or back, you know, when I was really young peanuts or something like that, but I've always had that. And I was always more like, to me, they were like little pieces of art. They weren't really something that I played with as much as they were something that I just loved and admired and put on my shelf. So I was doomed. I was doomed from the beginning, but I would say, um, my take on this and why I think I ended up gravitating towards sea monkeys was, you know, when you're a kid, like you have no control, you are a pawn in the adult world. So the only thing that like my kingdom was my pets and my toys and my imagination. And I think sea monkeys really fed all three of those. Yes. That's why you're the king of the sea monkeys. uh, (laughs) It's such a vivid childhood memory to me and then it was something that kind of reoccurred you know a couple times every decade um so it's it's that sentimental tug i think back to back to childhood you know and it is and a lot of people that don't collect don't really understand it like my my collecting started 
you know, back in the eighties with, it was kind of a way to bond with my father. We collected sports cards and sports, you know, sports memorabilia, stuff like that. And then when that market kind of got flooded and, you know, they started raising the prices, we kind of switched over to comic books. Well, I kind of stayed with comics. He stayed with the sports cards. And then, you know, I, I branched out from, you know, from comic books to the comic toys, then to, you know, the toys that I, I had as a child. And I, I just kept kind of building, you know, off of that over the years. And it, you know, almost kind of turned into an obsession, but it wasn't even so much just about yeah. having the items. It was the hunt. It was, um, you know, meeting people that had the same interest and talking to them and hearing their stories about, you know, why they collect, how they collect and all that. And, you know, that, that's kind of like the biggest part is the, the community. In it. And now, even when I go to, you know, comic shows or horror conventions, you know, you meet other collectors and you hear how, you know, how, how collecting, you know, played such a huge role in their life, you know, where, you know, a, a lot of us, you know, collectors, you know, we were kind of, you know, outcasts or, you know, we were kind of different, you know, we, we were always caught up in our own imaginations, you know, whether it was in school yeah, or, absolutely. you know, at home, it was, you know, like for me, I remember being in school and just thinking about, I can't wait to go home to, to look at my toys and look at my comic books and, and all that. And then when I was home, that's all that consumed me. And it, it still does to this day, you know, when I'm at work, I'm, I'm thinking about, you know, going home and, you know, sorting through my comics or, you know, dusting off my, my shelves of, of figures or, you know, doing anything like that. So it's, it's still to this day. So, you know, it shaped me into the person I am today and it's still, a, you know, a huge part with me, which I, I think a lot of people that, that don't collect or never collected, you know, don't really understand, you know, that aspect of it. They just, I think some of them see it as, you know, you're, you're wasting your money on, on this or, or that when yeah you know, there's a much the other thing meaning is, though, is, is oh, hold on oh. Wait, wait, hold, hold on one second i'm gonna try and join on my computer since maybe it's my phone that's making that noise. i don't know i don't know yeah i hear some background noise i yeah i think so i thought it was a robbie the robot to add me on my computer or something <laughs> um i don't know if that is possible during the um well, let we'll, we'll find out. Um, we will find out. Sounds like there's a robot uh, yeah. in, the, in the background that's that's going. And it's fine because you know it could always be. Uh, I sent it to you. Try now, Joe, uh, Todd. And, I mean, I'm sorry, Dan. Well, I see he logged off, so maybe he have to log back on. No, that Dan, Dan Goodsell is still. Am I here? Either. Oh, I don't see him on mine. But... He he disappeared yeah. just like the uh, the there. box that Eddie <laughs> sent us all the objects in that he was with it. Uh, now he went off. He, he's still never going to get over that, Todd. You know that. He's never going to live that down. Okay. Do you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Now I'm on my computer, so hopefully yes. that noise is going to stop. Okay. There, yeah, you sound a lot better. I I before you were kind of. Hey Dan, I, I got. I, I think that I think that background's coming from Eddie's side. No, I didn't come. Eddie, you got some side. robots in the background there. Oh, <laughs> oh man, yeah. Well, <laughs> private robot, private robots. <laughs> Your robot hey, army. <laughs> sure. Hey, Dan, I got a question for you. I don't. You're you're familiar with the Universal which one? Monster Army, the forum, correct? The forum, no, I don't Universal think so. Universal Monster Army. Okay, Universal Monster Army is a forum that at one time had about, I don't know, 72,000 members, and they all discuss, you know, monster-related items and stuff like that. Well, in 19, I don't know, 2001 or 2002, I decided to, for the first time, since I have the original Monster Ghost from the Melton Company and probably the only one in the world, um, I decided to take a, you know, a photo of it and I put it on eBay and I auctioned it off for a million dollars just for the heck of it. And um, I had quite a few amount of people respond to it. The curator, curator of the uh, curator, I mean, of the Universal Monster Armies took my photo and he basically posted it on the forum. And every photo you see today of the seven foot monster was actually mine all over the internet. It, it was used by a million people. 
And then the other mistake I did was uh, in 1987, I think I was, I met with Mr. Wagman and from the Honor House Company. And when I went to the back, I asked uh, one of the workers in the warehouse, the manager, if there was anything left. And he told me they had just thrown out every Honor House stuff a few weeks before. But he went in the back and he gave me a total of 11 Frank, I'm sorry, 12, no, 11 Frankensteins, the plastic versions, and he gave me 12 skeletons. Well, I flooded the market with the darn thing. You know, I sold them one by one. And then at the end, I was able to get to a company called LB, which was in Texas. And it was in one of those early mail order companies from the 70s as well. And you always saw a little B in comic book. It says LB. And he sold wooden nickels. And he sent me an additional three he had. I think I came, believe it or not, like 20 some dollars for them. In fact, it was kind of funny because there was a time you were selling one. And I think I inquired about it. And then I, I decided, well, I have so many. What do I need? Yeah. But what I was trying to do Imagine was that. Crazy. No, no. What then? The, the, the story I wanted to tell you was kind of crazy. There was a guy that contacted me a few years ago, and he says to me, "Hey, Eddie, I bought this Frankenstein from this guy over in I don't know. I think it was in, in um, Nevada." And when he gives me the guy's name, I go, "Wait a minute! I think I sold him one." And he goes, "Well, yeah, I paid three hundred. I said, "You paid three hundred. I sold it to the guy for 179, you know, and he goes, what do you think I can get for it? So I say, you know what, why don't you put it on eBay, put it with a buy now for 520 and start it out like 450. Would you believe the next day he calls me up and says he sold it? And I'm like, damn, yeah. <laughs> there goes the Frankenstein I sold for 200, right? I kind of flooded the market. I kind of regret it. I'll tell you why I regret it a little, because if I would have known the popularity that there was going to be with mail order and novelties and stuff like the ghosts and stuff, I would have let that be an unboxing mystery that would have been solved. Like what I did with, if you go on my YouTube channel, you'll see, I have the unboxing of the Polaris sub, which is probably the only one in the world. Um, in fact, I don't know if I mentioned Dan, but I'm actually, I'm waiting because of the COVID. It kind of screwed me over because I had right before on, on February, I had a, a four hour interview with NBC, the sci-fi channel, for a thing called Science Wire. They were going to do a story on my collection. And then from there, uh, that didn't get anywhere to the fact that I have to wait till the end of November uh, for the COVID. And I don't know if it's going to get anywhere, but I was asked if i like to appear before Rick in, in Pond Stars over in Las Vegas, the History Channel. And right now I'm I'm kind of like I'm, I'm afraid of flying, so I really don't like getting on a plane more than two hours. And I'm thinking that I got to get so I even consider driving down to Las Vegas because they told me I have to be there two to three days for the set. And I've been like hoping, honestly, they don't even call me because my stomach is turning every time I think of it because they haven't given me a specific date, but they said it could be at the end of November, it could be in the beginning of next year. Uh, it's for next season, you know, but that happened because of how rare my collection is. I mean, how rare, no, how rare the stuff I have, uh, just like you have those two things. I have the two monster ghosts. The one, if you know, is the one Kirk wanted to get the, the mail order mysteries, I think was based over that ghost that he flew all the way up here to meet me. And the other one, um, well, in fact, if you look at the book, Mail Order Mysteries, I would say 75% of the items in there are mine. Everything from the Dracula with the Frankenstein with the original boxes, the Moon Monster in there, all that's mine. Um, the only thing I don't have is uh, Ray Castillas supplied all his mask, you know, the tops. Because my mask is a big ball of the Teen Wolf that I have. Uh, <laughs> melted into one giant piece yeah. of rubber. It's funny. Is, the, is the oversized flat uh, sculpts, which I thought was really interesting for the pirates. Yeah, I was gonna, I was gonna tell that story. Which are you talking about, Osman? Um, we're at the flea market at our Rose Bowl flea market, one of our local fleas once a month, and we came up on this booth, and there, there the guy had the original. Uh, sculpts of, I believe it was three or four of the uh, pirates, the the comic book flat pirates, and dug through all of his stuff, and he original films, sixty millimeter films for the um, the commercials for the Spud Gun. Also, there were a bunch of photos and slides of Cosman and 
and his companies and stuff. Wow. There were actually all these, there was like 20 or 30 beefcake photos of Kostman like getting out of pools and stuff. It was like really strange. No. Did you did you ever speak to Joseph Kosman? Let me tell you, he was I never spoke to his uncle. I, I never even knew that. But Joseph Kosman, I called him one time and it was kind of funny because I told the story in a, in a past uh, show when you said that. I called him up concerning the spud gun and I told him I had read, but I, I had wrote a uh, an ad that actually the guy from California, Melvin Powers, actually uh, turned around and, and took away from me. And um, I put mail order mysteries revealed, uh, mail order secrets revealed, you know, make millions, whatever. And he put mail order millionaire reveal secrets. So after I asked him why the magazine wouldn't take my ad, because they said, I, because, you know, I was a newbie and magazines wanted experienced people. But in the process, I decided to call Joseph Kosman. And I spoke with him for good, uh, almost two hours on the phone. He was a, 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 um, very, very interesting thing. Uh, he, I mean, an interesting person. He was really, really great. Um, but it was kind of, it was really, it was, it was a nice no, guy to talk to. I, I think, I don't know that process. how interested he was in, in the continuation of this type of business. You know, it seems like he sort of thing in that kind of thing when I did a little bit of research on it. So I'm, I've never been a guy that like went and tried to talk to people very much. I'm, you know, I, I sort of pursue this stuff as a collector as opposed to, a, you know, a straight up historian, which it's always sort of been my approach. Yeah. Yeah. I, I kind of like the, I kind of like both aspects of it, you know, go, you know, learning about it, the history and all that. And then also collecting. I, to me, it kind of goes, you know, the way I look at it, you know, kind of hand in hand is, you know, if I have something, I want to, you know, know the history behind it. That's kind of like, you know, going back to the Bazooka Joe, you know, I, I, I never knew that the comics went back. I, I believe yeah. it was to like 54 or something like that. I, I never knew they went back that far. I, I, I thought they were something <laughs> that started in the eighties. So, yeah, I mean, you know, I, I knew nothing about it. So I, when I was looking online and I started seeing, you know, 50s, 60s, 70s, I, you know, I wanted to learn more about it. So I, that's why I got the book and I started reading on it. And I'm like, there's this whole other world to like Bazooka Joe that if I didn't, you know, investigate and, you know, research and learn the history, I, I would have never have known anything about it. So I, I kind of look, you know, as collecting it and, you know, the history yeah. is going kind of. That's, that's one know, of the nice things about it. where we're at now with oh, the internet oh. and, a lot of people have put a lot of energy into putting stuff, putting information on the internet. And also so many of the categories have been dealt with through books yeah. so that, you know, I mean, like you say, you know, when, uh, when Kurt did mail order mysteries, it really just sort of codified so much information about, about that stuff. And okay, that's, you know, that's let's, very let's very a lot of us too. pick up that book yeah. and, and be a part of it as opposed to having to, you know, spend $300 to buy a, you know, thin sheet plastic Frankenstein. Did, did, did you hear the story, Dan, of uh, Kirk, how he came um, out? I don't know if I've heard that one. I actually did it, did an interview on my web, webs, uh, on my YouTube with Kirk. I did a well, couple interviews with him. So yeah. we, Yeah, the, the situation with Kirk is that Kirk worked for uh, Dave Harvestat, and he worked doing for the S.S. Adams Company. Uh, Dave is my partner in um, in one of my businesses, Agme House Novelties. And way back, uh, you know, uh, Dave uh, told me about Kirk uh, as a guy that could do graphic arts and stuff like that. So he connected with me, and then we – I had never – had a Johnson Smith ghost. I, I just had the instructions that Craig had given me back in 1985. So in, I think it was like 2001, they had some guy bought a real estate office in California. And uh, Kirk tells the story, if you look at it in the famous Monsters magazine, and he also tells it on his blog, how it happened. And what happened was, is that I was bidding on this and I said, hey, I, I can't lose this because I've never seen another ghost show up other than mine so i said this is uh, one of those auctions no regardless the payment 
So to make a long story short, I had three people getting ready to bid for me. I was shaking, whatever. And Kirk was planning the same thing in his school thing. I outbid him. But the price was $982 for the ghost. And Kirk, <laughs> because of the fact he lost, um, he was kind of upset about it. And then he wrote to the guy that sold it and said, hey, I'll give you $40 for photographs of the product. So he uh, contacts me and says, hey, you know, I, well, I contacted him. And then he goes back and says, hey, Eddie, this is you. So he got all excited. So th when he was offered to do, or I think he went around to do mail order mysteries, he contacted me and said, hey, I'd like to photograph your collection for the book. So that's why the book, and has a page in the back in 156, I'm on it. Is so dedicated to me because I think 90%, not 90, 75% of that collection is all mine in that book, Every almost every item there. And that's how we became friends. And um, uh -oh, someone's getting a, uh, yeah, a sci fi message. That's, uh, that, that's the background noise. Um, <laughs> no, you know what? Robot the Army has awakened. <laughs> I, I was thinking of the, yeah, this is so funny. I was thinking of uh, the movie Forbidden Planet. When you hear yeah. it, it has this in the background that I always hate. And our, our episode this time has turned out to be one of those sci-fi episodes. Yeah, there, there's actually five of us, the, the robots <laughs> in the background trying to right. talk. It happens. You, you, never know, you never know what's going to go on with these. The first video I did for the YouTube channel, my dog started barking in the middle of it. So. <laughs> So, and it's funny when you have a great episode is when it happens. Yeah, I always get some, but that, that's, the, that's the fun of it. You never know what's going to happen. Hey, you know, we we are the house of the unusual, so you can always expect something unusual. You can depend on it. Uh, yep. To happen. Um... Absolutely. <laughs> Well, hey guys, we're we're getting down to the the bottom here, so let's let's start wrapping this up. Uh, Dan, uh, you got any final words uh, for everyone out there? And then you want to throw out your your website, yeah, social um, media, and all that place to, good stuff uh, for everyone. Look for me um, is probably on Instagram because I run a sort of dedicated collectibles uh, page on my Instagram. And let me see what uh, it is. I always forget it's TikTok Toys Two, and so. Uh, you can look for that, or you can look for. I also have a shaky bacon one where I do my Mr. Toe stuff. And you can look at my website, theimaginaryworld.com. And like I said, I also have a YouTube channel where I have a lot of collectibles content that you can watch some of that. I'll watch and see like all the, the nutty things I collect. But um, thanks, for, thanks for having me on here. It's been fun. Yeah. Absolutely. Now I just went on your TikTok toys on Instagram and I see your your most recent oh, post is it? too. Is <laughs> there the it is. Joe you know? rappers. <laughs> oh yes, yeah, the, absolutely. The, the grape cherry so, yeah. and uh, apple wrap. It's a lot of bubblegum, candy, cereal, awesome. bread, uh drink mixes, all you know, all sorts of stuff that was any product that was pitched to kids from about nineteen fifty five to about nineteen seventy five is is sort of my sweet spot. Sure. Hey, uh, Joe, Dan, before we go here, did, the which did you one? get the robot plants I've been looking for, brother? The robot plants, the seven-foot robot plants Ro from the Ro Company? Robot? Did you ever buy robot plants? Oh, plans. Plans robot. for making a robot? Plans. 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 You remember the uh, seven-foot robot plants that were sold by the Melting Company, the same company that sold the seven-foot monster ghost and the um, I, hideous I vampire actually, bat. I actually never ordered Blood anything as a kid. Vampire. Mail order, like like. So, but you've never come across any collection of papers? No copies of papers. No, you I've never run stuff. across that. I've only ever and found a few that? mail order things. You know, the couple of things Todd mentioned, and the couple of things I probably sent to you. Yeah. Um, you know. But you wouldn't get, see. But you wouldn't do mine. I can't believe you. Doing I, I, I can only find what I can in? find. <laughs> I, I, I would love to find robot plans. I'd love to find actual robots. Uh, yeah, I'm always out there looking for stuff. If if you Google 
If you Google seven foot monster robot plants, when you have a chance, you'll see what I'm talking about. It shows a kid inside this supposedly built robot. It has destroyed my life, man. I haven't found it in 40 years. <laughs> and, and, you know, I, I've been very sad. And Todd was trying to create, but I, I saw him trying to make a fake one for me, hoping to get my... Oh, so someone does have these robot hasn't, plans. It hasn't worked. Like, ah. I, you, you know what? To be honest with you, no, the ones that you see there are probably going to lead back to one of my sites. The actual oh, plants... Oh, I see. Are, no one has. Well, like, that's, that is the years. sad thing about collecting is you look for 40 years and there are always going to be things that, that elude you. Um, I, I have a little small list of things oh, yeah. that I've always Absolutely. been sort of looking for, including a few candy wrappers and whatnot. And some of them just are never going to show up. You, you should send me that list, Dan, because it sounds crazy, but Todd will tell you he's, he's gone on FaceTime with me through my searches and I found quite a few things that, <laughs> that Todd became very happy to own. So, I like that. <laughs> Like an empty box. Whoa, whoa. There, there's one particular thing. If you go to our site, he decided to make a mock-up of it of me. So you'll yeah, Dan, what I'm you'll find about. that one of my favorite new has, pastimes is making fun of Eddie. Uh, I could, I can see that you enjoy that thoroughly, and um, have no idea how Eddie feels about it. <laughs> <laughs> I got nothing I can't do. We, I, I, I can't afford to pay him for a laugh track, so I need him. I gotta somehow let him, you know, earn his keep. Earn... Yeah, there you go, <laughs> Todd. What, Todd, uh, what, what's your what's your final thoughts for the night? And give everyone your okay. Well, your, uh... <laughs> your websites and all that, that good stuff. I don't know. It's, it's always fun to talk to Eddie and Joe and guys. Dan, it's it's really great to be back in touch with you. It's been a long time. The last thing I bought from you was through Funzo on eBay, and it was a uh, in-store toy banner for the Chickubator, the um, old hatchery. That 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 stuff all came from um, a whole load of old toy store uh, display posters that I bought, I think, off of eBay, and there was some really weird stuff in there. Yeah, that was that's a great one. I love it. So, um, but yeah. So, and I was going to ask you: Do you remember a Joel Rasmussen? Yeah, I uh, I usually see Joel every year at Comic Con. I would love to be back in contact with Joel. He was a great guy from back in the day. If you got his contact information, yeah, send me an email or find you know, okay. yeah, because I, I think I tried to find you on Facebook at some point and couldn't find you on Facebook. So. I'm not, yeah, I don't do social media, but you can find me at Eddie's night, which is half of the unusual usual dot com, and I've got a, I just started a little side blog called Gullibles Babbles, which is. Literally, just like me reminiscing about my past, my childhood, the things that kind of floated my boat. Um, there's going to be an upcoming post on the possum family that's now living in my family room. That is absolutely weird and fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Todd, I'm still waiting for my uh, my drawing for Crypto Classics to put on on my yeah, page. Yeah, I just. Know. And you know what's Had so funny? movie star stuff going on. You know what's so funny? <laughs> That's right. To the house of the unusual, and we never let him to leave. I tell you, Dan. Don't um, ask us, Dan, how we it, met him. I'm pretty stubborn, and I've said no to Eddie numerous times, but he's I think he's even more tenacious than I am because he keeps sucking me back in. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, we're we're at the bottom here, so yeah, we, thank you. Dan, thanks for for being on the the podcast. You, you're welcome back anytime. Uh, Todd, you know we'll, we'll get more of you on here as well too. And um, you know everybody out there, visit houseoftheunusual.com. We have a a forum site on there that you could join. Uh, you could interact with other uh, collectors and, and people with similar interests. You could also post uh, what you'd like to to hear on the show. And if you want to be a guest, you could also. Uh, put it on there as well. We have the Crypto Classics and Gullibles Babbles blogs on there. You could also find us on Instagram under Crypto Classics House of the Unusual and also on YouTube uh, House of the Unusual. Go on the YouTube channel, click subscribe, and check out all the awesome videos we have on there. So that's all we got for tonight, guys. So thanks, everybody, for, for stopping in and, and joining. See you guys soon. Take care, guys.